actually Anna Nicole Smith. This morning, tragic beauty. Anna Nicole Smith died. Anna Nicole Smith has died. Anna, Anna, one more time. She might have been one of the most famous faces in the world. Shooting for guests makes Anna Nicole Smith a star. Ba, 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 boom. Wow. She was ridiculed, but there's a whole story the public doesn't know. People have a perception that she was this dumb blonde. She wasn't. I'm fine. I'm well. I'm here. Every single thing I touch has a story to it. She snagged a very rich man who was near death. One of the world's richest men. Anna never gave a about money. She loved Mr. Marshall tremendously. He left her nothing. Zero. She is one hot mess. Except maybe she's not that hot anymore. Make me beautiful duets. Anna Nicole Smith just gave birth to a baby girl only to have her 20-year-old son Daniel die at her maternity bedside. And then the unimaginable happens. Anna herself dies just five months later. The question of why no one called 911 sooner is never fully answered. Do you know what this even is? I thought it would be important to show Danny Lynn a little bit about where her mom came from. There you are with your mommy. <laughs>
County of population 7,459 people. Anna told me she always wanted to get out of there. But I am excited to meet Anna's friend, Joe. I'd never met her before. She kind of held the key to a lot of stories that I thought was important for our journey. My name is Joe McLemore. Anna Nicole and I were best friends. So I'm really looking forward to meeting Danny Lynn for the first time. Yes. Hi, yes. hey, so good to meet you. Nice to meet you too. For, after all this time. Oh my goodness, yes. you are your mommy. You look just like her. When I first met her, that's exactly what I remember. Just like that. You're so beautiful. Okay. Anna Nicole Smith's birth name was Vicki Lynn Hogan. She lived in Houston with her family, but she did have problems in Houston. Her mom, Virgie, is 16 when she gets married and gives birth to Vicki. The father, Donald Hogan, is soon out of the picture. Vicki Lynn's mother, Virgie, was a deputy sheriff in Houston. She carried herself like a deputy sheriff. She was very stern and forthright and very strict. Vicki's childhood life was tough. She was in an abusive situation. She was sexually abused and physically abused. That's what she told me. And that's what she would cry about. I wasn't there, but I believe her. She is sent to Mejia, this tiny, dusty town, to live with her Aunt Kay and her cousins. Mejia had nothing. Mejia was like being sent to the end of the world. We had nothing in Mejia. We didn't have a bowling alley. We didn't have anything. What we did is, it was called the drag. And you go up and down the street, and you drink beer, <laughs> and you talk to people, and hang out the window, hello, and things like that. That was it. This is the house where Anna Nicole lived with her aunt and her cousin. As you can tell now, it's vacant. Two bedroom, but we made the porch into a three bedroom. A three little bedroom. <laughs> She been hoping for, you know, a better environment for herself. When she went to school here in Mejia, she was miserable. She was having a hard time with being bullied. At that point, I think, after all she'd been through, all the struggles in her life, she was finally fed up and she said, you know what, I'm done. And she said, I'm quitting. I don't want to be here anymore. And we actually went and picked her up the day she walked out of the school and she never went back. So this is where your mama and I used to hang out. We'd come over here after work or between, you know, the shifts and just cruise through here. Uh, was there anything else to do this? Yeah, there's nothing else to do here, Danny. <laughs> there's no movie theaters. I mean, there wasn't Starbucks or anything. Basically, the main place to eat was Krispies. Give me directions. Jim's Crispy Fried Chicken. Catching directions to Jim's Crispy Fried Chicken. This is Crispy's. You can already smell the chicken. You can smell it. <laughs> <laughs> You're not even opening, you can uh, smell it. Uh, it's so great. So I was working here, and she would come in every day, and she'd order a large drink, but she always looked really sad to me. Sad? Yeah, she always looked very, very sad. But when she started working here, um, we immediately headed off, and one of the memories I have of her is we'd sit here together and stare out the window and just watch traffic go by. She was so perfect to me, perfect face. And I would tell her, you're so, so pretty. She gets pretty sweet on the guy who runs the fry later, whose name is Billy Smith. And so before you know it, she and Billy Smith are an item. And not much longer, Billy Smith marries Vicky and makes her Vicky Smith. Billy was also a high school dropout, and they were so young. He was 16, she was 17, and then she had her son when she was 18. I thought to myself, I'm so lonely. And I thought, well, if I have a baby, I'll never be lonely again. And I have my son, and I'm not lonely, and I love him, and he's great and wonderful. Her and Billy started having problems. They couldn't make things work out. So she decided, I'm leaving. She left Billy. 
Vicki leaves her husband and decides to move back to Houston with her mom, Virgie. She has barely a 10th grade education. She has work experience at a fried chicken restaurant, and she's now a single mom with no other apparent skills. She works a little at Walmart, and she works a little at Red Lobster, but they don't earn a ton of money. So what she does is walk into a gentleman's club and ask if she can get a job. There were a number of strip clubs near the Walmart where she worked, and one of them had a big blue and white sign that had a woman in a bikini. I would drive by the work every day, and there was this big neon sign. It was blue and white, and it had this um, lady in, in high heel shoes, and she had the bikini on, and it would flash tiptoe and back, tiptoe and back, like that. And I was like, oh, how, you know, how neat. I didn't know it was topless, so I didn't, I didn't know anything about that. You must have been pretty naive. <laughs> I, I was, trust me. Vicki may have been naive, but she was about to learn a lot very quickly. Everything in Texas is bigger and bolder. And there was no place that was wilder and maybe more fun than Houston back in the 80s. It's a port city, and I think port cities are more kind of fluid. People are passing through, and maybe they think they won't be remembered so they can act out a little more. It was a tawdry place in a lot of ways. The huge sprawling gentlemen's clubs were founded here. Breast enhancements were developed here. People were always making themselves up here. In 1986, Anna Nicole's name was Vicki Lynn Smith. She had just moved back to Houston with her son, whose father was out of the picture. She needed a way to support herself. She's very uneducated, and she had to get a quick job or a quick fix in order to take care of her son. So she did start dancing initially because that's the only way she had a way to make income. My former wife, uh, Melissa, used to work at the executive suite in North Houston. It was a higher class gentlemen's entertainment club and uh, she was there the day Vicki Smith walked in the door to apply for a job as a waitress and uh, later become a dancer. First thing uh, Melissa, my wife, noticed was that Anna was just terrified, literally terrified. I mean, she was definitely green to that kind of lifestyle. She was always tall, a large girl, and she was very self-conscious about that and very, very shy, introverted. It was tough taking my clothes off, and it was tough doing the table dances. The day that I went on to dance the first time, I, I ran out because I was so horrified and so ashamed of myself. But when I was driving to work, I looked down and saw all this money in my... And I was like, wow, and it was like $50. <laughs> like, whoa, $50. And back then, that was a lot of money for me. She was living with her friend Melissa, and her son Daniel was living with her mother, Virgie. Anna wanted him to move in with her. Her biggest fear was that Daniel would forget about her and not ever want to be with her again. Daniel was her life. She said, I'm, I am going to be the sexiest in here because I need money and I need to take care of my son. And she pulled that off very quickly. And I've represented some strippers as a criminal defense attorney. They're assessing the room. They're looking for the guy who has an ability to spend. Then they have to figure out, well, which role does he want me to play? Anna developed a baby's voice when she talked to guys and uh, she would get in that mode and they would just break down. They would eat that up. The irony is that when she started out, Anna Nicole was, in her own words, flat chested. She didn't have B, C, B, she didn't have that. She had little tiny breasts. And so she begins saving money and now begins to engage in a series of breast augmentation procedures. 
that's when she really started making the big bucks. Men loved the fact that here was this big old Texas girl with that big old blonde Texas hair. Believe it or not, as good as she was at dancing, it was still in her mind that this was just not who I am. She never felt comfortable with it. She would just continuously say, you know, I, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. I'm, I'm, I'm disrespecting myself, my mother, my child. So it's 1991, and Vicky's been dancing for four years, when an unlikely figure is wheeled in the front door. He is J. Howard Marshall II. J. Howard Marshall is about to change Vicky's life because he is not your average 87-year-old billionaire. J. Howard Marshall comes from a prominent East Coast family. He's Yale-educated, works in the Roosevelt administration on oil projects, and eventually becomes associated with the famous Koch brothers, which turns him into a billionaire. So Marshall's second wife is stricken with Alzheimer's, and he's a very lonely man. So he then begins a 10-year relationship with a very exotic, flamboyant stripper named Lady Walker. He lavished her with flowers, love notes, diamonds. He was still married, and both he and Lady Walker agreed that it would be very wrong uh, for them to have sex. He spent millions and millions of dollars on her over the years. But whatever their relationship was about, it didn't seem to be about sex. He felt like he was her protector. He would write her these florid romantic notes, which she would respond to in kind. And along with giving her these florid romantic notes, he'd give her checks, lots of them. So the relationship is very devoted, but Lady Walker suddenly dies. Here was Marshall, he'd lost his wife, who he really did love, to Alzheimer's. He'd lost his paramour, who I think he really did love, uh, who died on the operating table getting a facelift. So it's October 1991, and Marshall is despondent. So when he wheels into Gigi's one lunchtime and sees this 24-year-old blonde dancer in front of him, his heart is taken. He had no will to live. And I went over to see him, and he got a little twinkle in his eyes, and um, he asked me to dance for him, and I did. Um, he was very funny, really funny. He got um, very brilliant, um, very smart. Uh, gosh, he had so many stories. I mean, just, oh, he was an amazing man. He was just really amazing. From the very first time she met Howard, she thought of him as a grandfather figure. And once we met Howard, I mean, you thought the same way. Very likable man, very knowledgeable, very smart. They would phone call every day and talk to each other. And they were so cute on the phone. She would call him sugar Booker and sweetheart and all that. And they needed each other in more of a sense than people understood. Um, and so they just took care of each other. Marshall had two sons, and the son he was closest to was Pierce Marshall, who was this very upright, waspy, proper person. I think Anna Nicole would have just sent him screaming from the room. Pierce wants to put an end to it right away, but J. Howard Marshall II tells his son Pierce, she makes me enjoy life again, but out. So within a week of meeting Vicky, Marshall proposes marriage. She says no, because she's determined to make something of herself on her own. So what J. Howard Marshall doesn't know is that Vicky is in love with someone else. And in this case, it's a woman. There's a game that uh, dancers use in a club wherein they work the guy with a story that they're together as, as women and most of the time they're just playing the role, you know, to get, uh, to get the guy to spend his money. But that pretty quickly evolved into the real thing with Anna. So around the same time that she meets J. Howard Marshall, she meets somebody else. 
One day she walks into a gay club and all eyes are on Anna. But her eyes are on this woman named Sandy who works in a store that sells garden supplies. Anna shows up at her house in a big white limousine with flowers and gifts. And their relationship got very, very serious. Anna said she loved Sandy. They had wedding rings. You know, they were going to carry on a continual relationship. She even mentioned that, you know, that, would, that was going to be her life. They lived together for a while, and it seemed like they had a very loving relationship. And uh, she had a boyfriend, a girlfriend. It was not abnormal for Anna to have several boyfriends or girlfriends at the same time. She didn't hide it, and it didn't bother her. She seems to be a woman of considerable appetites. She likes a lot of input. She eats and drinks freely. She seems to take on a fair amount of lovers. Thanks to her time with J. Howard Marshall II, she develops a new appetite for extremely expensive jewelry. He gives Vicky jewelry, a house, a red Mercedes convertible and breast augmentation surgery. And he buys her a ranch and Arabian horses to go with the ranch. Vicky loves animals and she especially loves her horses. This is Rose. This is my horse. So he takes Vicky to his favorite restaurant, Red Lobster, and there he proposes again. I mean, he's a billionaire, and his favorite restaurant is Red Lobster. And he actually asked her to marry him at the table. And Anna said, no, I, I'm not going to get married until I'm able to support myself and, and make it on my own. I'm going to make it on my own. So at the time, even while she's engaged in this kind of elaborate courtship with J. Howard Marshall II, she has a boyfriend, and he takes a few pictures of her and sends them to a photographer, manager, scout for Playboy in the Texas area. She came in, I was quite taken. She looked like an Amazon woman to me. Very, very tall, five foot 11, wore five inch heels, a spandex dress, this god awful blue eyeshadow. But underneath all of that, you saw the pretty face. Uh, she walked a little clumsy. She walked like a duck. But Anna Nicole Smith was the sweetest girl you would ever want to meet. I mean, you would want her as a sister. Sent the film off the very next day, Playboy called and they said, this girl's gonna be a playmate. Around 1992, my uncle called me, who lived here, and said, Nikki made Playboy, and I said, what? He said, she made Playboy, and I said, she did not. And I was kind of weirded out. I was proud of her, but I was like, she's up here now, and I'm down here, and she's never gonna... I'm a little person now, I, I think, was what I was feeling. She appears on the cover of Playboy in March of 1992. It is a life-changing event because Paul Marciano, who runs Guest Jeans, sees her photos. Marciano calls Playboy, and a meeting is set up. He came to see me, and I didn't think he liked me at first. So they put, um, made, up, made up my hair, and they made up, put a dress on me and stuff. And I remember him walking in the trailer. <laughs> I'll never forget. He walked up in the trailer, and his mouth just dropped. He was like... <laughs> I was like, ooh, I think he likes you now. <laughs> but Marciano thinks Vicky needs a new name. So together they come up with Anna Nicole Smith. When Anna Nicole Smith first sort of burst on the scene, she didn't look like any model anyone had seen for a long time. She was curvy. She was voluptuous. At a time when models were very, very thin. So much of the beauty that came before that was was really about this emphasis on the narrowness of the body that you just couldn't even achieve. Like, I'm like, am I even a person? So when you saw her, it was like, we are really doing something different. You know, you sort of like think about blondes as being this kind of metaphor for um, female power and female empowerment and the control that we actually have over men. It seems so exciting. Those pictures alone, I think, mesmerize the world. That first day shooting for guests makes Anna Nicole Smith a worldwide star. And she's about to get everything she could have possibly have dreamed of, and a lot of things that she never dreamed of that are kind of her nightmare.
The guest campaign is major. It shows up everywhere. It plays up Anna's glamour and makes her hugely famous. Meanwhile, Playboy continued to put her in the magazine, eventually naming her Playmate of the Year. I worked with her over a year's period of time, and you could see the difference because when she came in, she was just a girl from a fried chicken place. And now she was a big star. Ah, so beautiful. She wasn't going to trust anybody. She was just going to perform for you. It was like she was probably back in the strip club. She really had the ability to make you believe that you were very special. She starts modeling overseas. Her billboard ads turn up on Norwegian and Swedish highways. They're so sexy that there are traffic accidents. It got to the point where the parliament in Norway actually had a debate as to whether the billboards featuring Anna Nicole Smith should be taken down because they represented a threat to public safety. Anna Nicole Smith, that name, that face, that figure became a topic of international fascination. And where does someone like Anna Nicole Smith belong? Hollywood. Here she is, Anna Nicole Smith. Anna, how are you? I'm Regis. She's signed by William Morris, one of the town's biggest talent agencies. There's a film being made called The Hudsucker Proxy, and Nicole Smith winds up in The Hudsucker Proxy as a fashion model named Zaza. Did you have many lines? Well, just one. <laughs> one line? Yeah, but I got to growl like a cat in heat. <laughs> what does that sound like? <laughs> <laughs> Just give us a little preview of the movie. What, what does the cat sound like? Oh, uh, something like rare. <laughs> wow! Wow! She has her first line on the screen, in which she employs her boyfriend to punch Tim Robbins. And Sid says you stole it. What are you waiting on, Clarence? Pop him one. But Buzz. She makes the rounds on talk shows like the Arsenio Hall Show. You're, you're making the acting transition now. Um, didn't you just finish a project? I just finished the Head Sucker Proxy. And I'm um, fixing the I'm sorry, start. say that again? The Head Sucker yeah, Proxy. Yeah, I just like to see you say Head Sucker. <laughs> the first time I met Anna Nicole, there was a sparkle about her. As a journalist, you're trying to stay objective and all those kinds of things. And I have to admit, I just kind of fell in love with her. <laughs> She is so over the top in her sirenhood. She doesn't just play the girlfriend, she plays like the apotheosis of the va va voom girlfriend. And that's what she plays in Naked Gun 33 and a third. What are you doing? I'm uh, uh, just contemplating my next move. Your bishop is exposed. So Anne Nicole Smith appears in these two movies and she acquits herself fairly well. And it looks as if she might end up being something of a 1990s version of Jane Mansfield, who was a famous sex pot from the 1950s. Her figure is kind of her calling card, but it also leads to medical problems. She was in constant pain with her back from her implants. Her back wasn't strong enough to carry them. And so the doctors started to give her pain medication. She also suffers from migraines. So she's on all kinds of pain medication. She winds up in the hospital accidentally overdosing. Have you used drugs at all? I've never used drugs. I don't use drugs. You know, I had Vicodin and Xanax. That's prescription drugs that I have to take for my migraines and for insomnia. I mean, I don't, I don't consider that hard drugs. It doesn't make me high. It, it's, it's just, you know, I've been taking it for years. It just helps my headaches. You were very, very pale and very sick, and you had things in your arm, needles in your arms and things. What had happened? I'm fine. I'm well. I'm here. I'm not overdosed. I'm not dead. <laughs> um, I think they're trying to make it look like a Marilyn Monroe remake. One of the most famous stars in Hollywood history is dead at 36. Anna Nicole is a huge Marilyn Monroe fan. I hate a careless man. J. Howard Marshall even rents Marilyn Monroe's old house for her. 
Marilyn's window. When did you start loving Marilyn Monroe? I don't know. We just connect somehow. We have this special bond. It's just like, I don't know, I used to wish she was my mom. <laughs> yeah? I want to be the sex symbol. I want to be what she was. Uh, I want to do the movie she did. I want to sing. I want to dance. Uh, I want to do all that. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. People have a perception that she was this dumb blonde. She wasn't. Not at all. She could do anything that she wanted to do. What she decides to do after four years of turning down his proposals is to marry J. Howard Marshall. And they have a wedding ceremony for the ages. Her son is one of the ring bearers, along with one of his cousins. The ring is attached to a, a beautiful fluffy pillow. The groom is all dressed in white as he's wheeled up to the altar. Two doves are released to symbolize the beauty of their relationship. You may now kiss the bride. She even tries to get him to stand next to her at the altar, but he's an old man. He's, he's too frail to get out of his wheelchair. Anna Nicole Smith is 26. J. Howard Marshall is 89. And four hundred million dollars. Four hundred million? Yes. I'd marry him. <laughs> <laughs> so after they marry, they start to think about things that lots of new couples thinking about, which is having children. She and J. Howard Marshall consult a fertility expert, but he is eighty-nine, so that's not happening. By now sirens are going off in Howard Marshall's son's head about what's going to happen to the money he expects to inherit when his father dies. Anna Nicole lives in Los Angeles and J. Howard Marshall lives in Houston. And when J. Howard Marshall visits Anna in Los Angeles, Pierce hires detectives to watch them to make sure that they don't go and try to change the terms of J. Howard Marshall's will. But it was never about that. And she loved this man. She would sit close to him with her legs on the couch over him, and uh, he would laugh. <laughs> About six months after they got married, Mr. Marshall got very sick. We were shooting in Las Vegas, and she flew down to, to be with him. Pierce didn't like Anna Nicole Smith, this young 20-something stripper who's wormed her way into his father's life at the end of it? No way is he going to give her one dime. And it gets really ugly. J. Howard Marshall is in the hospital and his condition is clearly on the decline. And so enter his son, Pierce, who'd been given power of attorney. Marshall's caregiver, Betty Morgan, becomes his guardian. And then Anna finds herself cut off financially. And at one point, she's only permitted to see her husband for 30 minutes a visit. The family said that was because of the doctor's instructions, but she was heartbroken. And they had armed security guards just standing by the door. And when your, hus when your husband's got his arms out going like this, lady, love, please don't let me. And I'm leaving him. He's like thinking in his head, where's my wife going? The old man really had no control because he was essentially dying. 14 months after their wedding, J. Howard Marshall died. 90-year-old oil man J. Howard Marshall II has been dead for a week, but his remains have yet to be put to rest because of the legal bickering between his widow and his family. When he died, a huge fight ensues over whether we're going to cremate J. Howard Marshall II or whether we're going to bury J. Howard Marshall II. 
they have to go to court to settle this thing, which is pretty bizarre. And obviously the press goes wild. Anna Nicole Smith Marshall stepped off the elevator on the fifth floor into a horde of news media, who first began to sag back. And then when their quarry changed directions, it was off to the races. Anna Nicole Smith has conceded to the cremation of her deceased millionaire husband, J. Howard Marshall. She also has agreed to share a portion of the ashes with the oil baron's children. So then they have separate funerals. So at the funeral of her husband, Anna Nicole Smith is wearing the dress that she married him in. And to commemorate his passing, she sings. She sings, Wind Beneath My Wings. The Bette Midler hit. The wind beneath my J. Howard Marshall, when he dies, leaves a massive fortune. Estimates range up to $1.6 billion. However, he leaves nothing in his will to his wife, Anna Nicole Smith, or her son, Daniel. He left her nothing. Zero. 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 He was taking care of her. There was a suggestion, a promise, a, you know, was there a contract? Clearly not. She didn't get a contract. It turns out Pierce is the main beneficiary. So Anna Nicole sues Pierce in Texas for a share of the estate. It's going to be a battle royale between the bombshell and the billionaire. I have nothing to say. Thank you very much. But it will take years before the case gets before a jury. In this journal entry, Anna writes, me and Daniel have no money to live on because of the press and getting no work. I miss my husband. He would just kill Pierce if he knew what was going on. You know what her favorite thing was to do? Have you ever seen a VCR tape? Yes. Okay. She'd go up here to this blockbuster and she would rent movies and she'd just sit in the bed for like the whole weekend and order takeout food. She'd love to just stay in and watch scary movies. And then she'd paint. I plan to take Danny Lynn to Los Angeles because I thought it was important. Her mom lived half of her life in LA. I thought it would be great to have her sit down with Ray Martino, who shed some insight on her life prior to me meeting him. Hi, Dave. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good to see you. Hi, honey. R Ray, what year did you meet Anna? 1995. Starting to cast my film. And we got it, the script to Anna. She read it, we got a call the next day and she says, I want this part. She had a big price tag on her, but we could only afford a certain amount. The agency, William Morris, said, don't do this film. And she says, I get a chance to play different characters and I don't want to always play these bimbos. In a To The Limit, she plays a CIA double agent. Anna Nicole Smith, shoots a lot of guys. To the limit, went straight to video. This is what I look like when I'm sober. Her dream was to be a serious actor. I don't know if I can say the right words, Joe. She was very, very talented, very deep, tremendously emotional. She makes another movie with Ray Martino. It's called Skyscraper, but it's only seen overseas. William Morris and Anna parted ways and, you know, things weren't, uh, things weren't going well for her. What had appeared to be excellent opportunities started to dry up. She connects with this entertainment lawyer named Howard K. Stern. He soon becomes her confidant and her advisor. Here we go, right here. On top of her career problems, she's also having problems with her implants. I had had an apartment in Burbank and she was in the bedroom and she started crying, screaming and yelling. And we ran into the bedroom. She had a hand over her breast and her breast exploded. So I rushed her to the hospital and she was in terrific pain. She's got migraines, stomach problems, breast implants causing back pains. She's got seizures. She's taking methadone for pain, clonopin for those seizures. She's taking a lot of medication. I was on prescription pain medication and I was taking too much and um, 
I went into a coma for that. When I came out of the coma, I, I couldn't talk and I couldn't walk. It was pretty bad. It was real bad. Can we get through here, please? There aren't many offers and not much money coming in. Anna Nicole declares bankruptcy. The California federal bankruptcy judge finds that Pierce was conspiring with his lawyer and his accountant to cheat Anna out of her portion of the inheritance. Former Playboy playmate Anna Nicole Smith is a multi-million dollar winner. A Los Angeles federal court awarded Smith almost $450 million of her husband, J. Howard Marshall's estate. Ah! She goes from zero to $447 million. Cha-ching! Now she's a millionaire. Wait, there's another court in another state that could take it all away. But she's about to reinvent herself. Hello, Romeo. Hey, Punker Poo. She says yes to a reality show. And her life is going to get crazier and stranger than ever before. Anna Nicole Smith's wild night at the American Music Award. It was this surreal moment where Anna Nicole Smith winds up in front of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. My life is like a living soap opera. Let's go stop the camera, please. Let's give her a moment. As tragic as some of the events were, the cameras never stopped rolling. It was all about the cash register ring. Her friends say when they talk to her, she's rushed off the phone. Anna had a lot of people in her ear telling her things. She took my hand and she put it over on her stomach. She's pregnant. The next thing I know, she's taken off to the Bahamas. It's catnip for all the tabloids. Who is the daddy? I'm having a baby. It was almost like another episode of her reality show. She just started to cave in. I just started screaming her name. I asked her, I said, baby girl, if you got anything in you, please come back. Her death was this huge story. I mean, huge. I haven't been to the storage in years, to be honest. Daylin has no idea that she's going to see these things. Anna Nicole Smith has just won a huge chunk of her husband's estate in a court in California. But it's not over. She still has to do battle with his son in a different court in Texas and she could lose it all. We have an exclusive interview with Anna Nicole Smith. The celebrity model is the star attraction in a Texas courtroom later this week as she fights to claim a share of her late husband's $1.6 billion estate. She calls me and she says, well, I'm doing 2020. Now they were gonna give her a chance to put the, set the record straight. This story will not be a good story by beating up on you, but somewhere in the course of my interview with you, I'm hoping you can tell me what it was about you. him that you I so suspect you really loved. It was not his fortune that first attracted you? Oh, no, sir, not at all. What happened was he paid me enough money not to have to go back to that place I was working at, and he took care of me and my son. That must have felt good. That felt wonderful for him to love me and my son like that. He took care of me for many years. When did he begin broaching the subject of marriage with you? A week after I met him. I never was going to marry him until I got myself established. I wanted to make something of myself first before I got married. So people wouldn't think, oh, was this, you know, money person, you know, and backfired anyway. <laughs> You're saying being called a gold digger was your worst fear, and you did everything the other way around to make sure that would not happen? Right. And instead, what happened? It happened. Top 10, Anna Nicole Smith dating tips. Anna Nicole Smith. Number three, the convincingly fake excitement during sex. Just think about his stock portfolio. Never mind your heart. We can call an ambulance anytime. Come on, Tiger, what do you say? Yeah. What was it like when you used to see Jay Leno and Letterman savage you? After my husband passed, it, it was really, really hard on me. I guess they felt that, you know, you had made it on your own, but you wanted to marry, I guess the term is sugar daddies. That wasn't true. I mean, well, here's the, here's the question. Some would say it wasn't a real marriage. You're telling me 
tonight, sitting across from me, it was a real marriage? Yes, can we stop the camera, please? Okay. Let's give her a moment. The media thought this was, to some degree, a detective story. Like, is she a gold digger or is she not? And they were using those old kind of stereotypes to kind of, you know, rip the lid off this story. I could have married him a week after we met or two weeks after we met. I could have married him years before. And I didn't. I didn't. I went out and I made something of myself. To actually see her in tears and break down and really feel what she was feeling was heartbreaking. It's been five years now since he's passed away. Are you able to get your on with your life at all? Or looks to me like you're still... It's hard. I mean, I went through a lot. You know, people... You know, when I, when I gained a lot of weight, um, people thought I was just a party and doing this and that. I mean, I'm having seizures, I'm having panic attacks, and my husband just died and people think I don't care. They didn't for once consider that maybe this was an interesting notion of two people who they're making a transaction here are both lonely and find each other's company not only enjoyable, but have a modicum of love for one another. This is a pretty incredible story from beginning to end, isn't it? It surely is. And it's your life. <laughs> my life. My life is like a living soap opera. <laughs> Former Playboy playmate Anna Nicole Smith came to court prepared, armed with photos of her dead husband. She took the stand ready to fight. When Anna Nicole Smith walked into the trial, the odds were in her favor. There was so much money. Why not give her a little? And I don't want to call names. I'm not going to call Ms. Marshall a gold digger. I truly am not. How you decide what she is and what she did and why should be based on evidence. So Pierce's lawyer is Rusty Harden. He has a reputation for being a great trial lawyer. She will not be a poor little girl from Ahea, Texas, when the trial's over. He would have been about 86 years old at that time. What attracted you to him? I felt really bad for him. I felt sorry for him. I, I Are you the kind of person who takes in stray animals? If I seen one, I, I probably would, yes sir. Okay. He may be folksy, but he's also sharp as a tack and he knows how to cross-examine a witness. The letter from Pierce Marshall to you about your bills, do you remember that letter? Yes sir. And do you remember that he asked you to look at the date? And the date on that letter was February the 5th, as I recall, was it not? It can I see the letter again? Yes, ma'am. Is it still up I'm there? Really bad with dates. That's okay. I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> he wants to get her frustrated. So if she doesn't know dates, he's going to ask her about dates over and over again. Well, ma'am, that was in September, wasn't it? I'm bad at dates. I'm, I'm guessing. Was it before or after your depositions in May of 1995? I don't know the dates, Rusty. Isn't it true that you don't even know when you last saw your husband before he died. Yes, Rusty, I am bad with dates. The more he can draw out of her, the more he can get her frustrated, flummoxed. That only benefits him and his client. Are you telling me that the last time you saw your husband, you don't even remember how you got to Houston? Rusty, on a airplane. Her demeanor in the jury box was not the best. Have you been taking new acting lessons? <laughs> Screw you, Rusty. She was in over her head. I don't think she really understood how to present herself in a courtroom setting. By the end of the five days or so, she'd gone from walking into the courtroom with the jury pretty much on her side to having lost them. The jury in Houston says former Playboy playmate Anna Nicole Smith is not entitled to one red cent from her late husband's multi-million dollar estate. There are years of appeals and litigation ahead. And in the meantime, Anna still needs to keep working to pay the bills. So she makes a decision that could be the best or the worst career move she's ever made. Quit following me. She says yes to a reality show. You're so outrageous.
So there was two people. There was Vicki Lynn Marshall, and there was Anna Nicole Smith. I, myself, very fortunate to get to have met and gotten to know Vicki Lynn, but at the same time, see Anna Nicole in action. So it didn't matter if you had a cell phone, a Polaroid camera, any kind of camera, you just yelled at her name, Anna Nicole. And she turned around, it was on the spot. You saw Anna Nicole, it's like, wow. Anna, look at me. And the minute that camera left, it was a whole other person. She was back to Vicky Lynn. And how she did it, I don't know. But whatever she was doing, it was making everybody watch. In 2001, Anna is offered a show that's pretty new to television. She says yes to a reality show. Two thumbs up. My dream house. Reality shows are really pretty much fresh baked at this point. People like the Osbournes. Rock and roll! Or people like Nick Lachey and Jessica Simpson were doing these shows, revivifying their stardom. Any, me, any, okay. my, any, my. Okay. So here comes Anna Nicole Smith into this brave new world of celebrity reality television. That's my son, isn't he cute? Was that who she really was? The first season was quite a rating success. The yeah. luxurious hardware is coming up right now. Whatever she did, the crazier she got, I think was her ticket. It was all part of her plan. The ratings started to plummet in the second season and the show was canceled before the third season really got underway. And then she kind of disappeared for a little bit. She was out of the spotlight. No one really knew where she was. She makes a comeback. She gets a contract with Trim Spa, a diet pill. She drops 69 pounds. As she makes her way back on the scene, she meets the next man in her life, Larry Burkett. The first time that I ever encountered Anna was um, in my hometown of Louisville, Kentucky, working as a photographer at the Kentucky Derby. So I talked to her and we exchanged this kiss and she's kind of getting handsy. She was really smitten over him, and she told me that. She actually said, you know, she really liked this guy. I was asked by Anna's team to photograph Anna at a kids camp, a charity event, that I got to kind of witness Anna hanging out with the kids. It was a stripped down version of this small Texas girl that I, I, I really appreciated. You know, yeah, she talked very highly about Larry. Next thing I know, I've got my bags packed and I'm way out to Anna Nicole's house, moving in with her. While their relationship is kept out of the public eye, they developed uh, an intimacy. Anna lived in the house with her son, Daniel, her assistant, Kim, and her attorney, Howard K. Stern. He was kind of her publicist. He was kind of her agent. He was kind of the go-to person for Anna Nicole. Okay, please have quiet. Let's be quiet. Seconds, please. In 2006, I met Larry, and we sat down and talked about his life with Anna Nicole. Howard Stern. Yeah. That was a problem. What kind of a problem? In my opinion, he's, he's in love with Anna, and she's never really returned that affection towards him. He created a lot of problems for us. He would fill her head with ideas, negative th thoughts about me, to where she would actually sometimes be suspicious of things. Did you see evidence of drug use and alcohol use? Did she have a problem? I saw, um, I saw a lot of things I didn't like. You know. Never once in my relationship with Anna did I see her do any kind of illegal drug. Now I will say that she sometimes did not take the medication as she was prescribed the medication. Or then she might say, I skipped a day, so I might take two today. The night before the American Music Awards was the first time I ever saw Anna have a seizure. I was up with her all night. The next day, I just thought she should cancel it. But then everybody saw what happened next. I was honored to be on our next performer's new video. And if I ever record an album, I want this guy to produce my, make me beautiful duets. 
first thing you see in the headlines was Anna Nicole on drugs, Anna Nicole on this. I mean, that was what came out of that. Anna Nicole Smith's wild night at the American Music right. Awards. She's just getting over the crazy pox. <laughs> what the hell I put in that trim spa? Well, uh, we hope she has some people around who, who care about her and take <laughs> care of her. In the midst of all this strange and bad press comes the announcement that her longtime court battle for her elderly husband's estate is going to the Supreme Court. It was this surreal moment where Anna Nicole Smith, you know, the buxom playboy pinup girl, winds up in front of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. This case concerns the claim of petitioner Vicki Lynn Marshall to share in the large fortune of her deceased husband, J. Howard Marshall. Ruth Bader Ginsburg writes the opinion, and the Supreme Court decides that Anna Nicole Smith can pursue her claims in the lower courts. There was no end to her court battles. She was in litigation continuously for 11 years. It was affecting her tremendously, ruining her mental health and her physical health. kids and she always said that she wanted a little girl and I remember we were laying in the bed and she took my hand and she put it over on her stomach she had this big glowing smile on she brings out the pregnancy test and she shows me that um, she's pregnant and I was being a little bit vocal about medication she was taking and making sure that everything was done right he actually told me that she was pregnant and that Larry was the father and I don't know how it got to where it got she was told that he was only after her money, which is a laugh, and that he was a nobody. She started changing her tone. You're not the father, leave me alone. And then the next thing I know, she's gone, she's taken off to the Bahamas. True tragedy. Anna Nicole Smith just gave birth to a baby girl only to have her 20-year-old son Daniel die at her maternity bedside. It's an unimaginable turn of events. It was almost like another episode of a reality show. How does this happen? Anna Nicole and Howard K. Stern have moved to the Bahamas for the last three months of her pregnancy. Meanwhile, her son Daniel's living in L.A. with Ray Martino, and he's worried about what's going on with his mother. He was not favorable to what his mother was doing, and he didn't like the people that were around her. Her friends say when they talk to her, she's rushed off the phone. So her and I, we'd actually have communication when she was in the Bahamas. The conversations would happen in the middle of the night. And I don't know if she was doing it because she didn't want Howard to hear. September 7, 2006 is a huge day in the life of Anna Nicole Smith because that's the day that she gives birth to her daughter. And at her side is Howard K. Stern. He is filming everything that's happening. Entertainment Tonight buys that video for an undisclosed sum. Anna Nicole Smith gives birth right here tonight before your very eyes. Come on, baby. Daniel flies down to meet up with his mom and baby sister in the hospital room where Anna is recovering from a C-section. the night of September 9th. Daniel sleeps over in her hospital room in the Bahamas. He's sitting up in a chair that's across from her hospital bed. Howard K. Stern's in the room, he's in another bed. 
At 6.20 in the morning, the nurse sees Daniel tending to his mother. Around 9.30 in the morning, Anna Nicole wakes up. She sees Daniel sleeping by her side. She tries to wake him up, but he doesn't respond. She tries again, but his skin is cold. She realizes he's not breathing. So now she's terrified. She calls out to the medical staff, and they rush in. But it's too late. Daniel's already dead. The body of Smith's 20-year-old son, Daniel Smith, was found just three days after Anna Nicole gave birth to a baby girl in the Bahamas. Around 7 o'clock LA time, I get a call from Anna screaming and crying on the phone. Daniel's dead. As tragic as some of the events were, the cameras never stopped rolling. It was all about the cash register ring. Just days after Daniel's shocking death, In Touch magazine buys the photograph of Daniel meeting his baby sister for a reported $400,000. This was now both a family tragedy and a crime investigation. The chief inspector in the Bahamas coroner's office is calling the death of Anna Nicole Smith's son suspicious. How can you die in a hospital bed with nobody noticing? How can that have happened when a few hours earlier you were fine? And the cause of death of Daniel Smith still remains unclear. Finally, the official results come back, and it showed that Daniel died of a lethal combination of Lexapro, Zoloft, and methadone. Daniel actually had a prescription for Lexapro, and he was taking Zoloft because he was anxious about his flight. But nobody knows where he got the methadone. Anna's been on methadone for years. So did he take it secretly? To this day, no one knows how he got that methadone. So in the wake of this nightmare, there still remains an open question as to who the biological father of Anna Nicole Smith's daughter is. Howard K. Stern's name is on the birth certificate. So Anna Nicole and Howard decide to go to Larry King because if you're announcing who the father of your baby is, where else are you gonna go? Anna and I have um, been in a relationship and we love each other and it's been going on for a very long time. So you are the father? Yes, sir. I actually had to file a paternity suit. I was like, this is the last thing that I want to do. She's just lost her son. Daniel is buried in the Bahamas and his mother is devastated. For whatever reason, she blames herself for Daniel dying. It broke her heart when he died. And I think that was the final straw for Anna Nicole. To help her through her grief, Anna's friend, Dr. Christine Aroshevich, flies down to the Bahamas. She happens to be a psychiatrist who has the authority to write prescriptions. And she writes a lot of prescriptions. Dr. Arosevich writes Anna a new prescription to help her sleep at night. Anna's new drug of choice is chloral hydrate. But Anna, instead of taking the prescribed dose, she would sometimes just pick up the bottle and chug it. This new drug of choice was extremely dangerous. And Anna Nicole Smith didn't know how dangerous it was. of Daniel Smith's death has not yet the been determined. The chief inspector office is calling the death of Anna Nicole Smith's son suspicious. It is said when you lose a child, you always have one foot on earth and one foot in heaven. Anna Nicole is completely devastated by the loss of her son, Daniel. But there's kind of a bright spot. Bohemians have a very big heart, very friendly. So Anna had a whole support group, and that worked out really well. 
She befriends a local Bahamian couple, Brigitte Nevin and King Eric Gibson. He's a local musician and celebrity. We would take people out fishing. And then one day, the guy came and said, um, why don't you take Anna Nicole fishing? And so that's how I met Anna Nicole. And so from then on, then she decided to call King Eric daddy and called me mommy. And then they were just part of the family. I think she kind of looked at Brigetta kind of like a motherly type figure because she was calming and she was spiritual. She was attracted to families. Where there was a family, she, because she didn't have that. Anna adores this couple, and she loves being on the open sea, far away from the paparazzi. She just loved to be on the boat. She was totally different. She was just like being free. She stops talking about wanting to die and starts thinking about the future. She actually books a modeling gig and looks into buying a boat. Howard finds a boat for them to buy in Florida, so he and Anna go to pick it up. Their friends Bridget and King Eric will help them drive it back to the Bahamas. So Anna Nicole Smith leaves the Bahamas with a whole entourage, Howard K. Stern, bodyguard and Dr. Orosevich. They leave the baby with the nanny. Before she leaves the Bahamas, Anna gets a shot of HGH and B12 on her left side. She's been doing this for a while to maintain her weight. On the plane, her left side starts to hurt. By the time she gets to the hotel, she's starting to feel really sick. She has a fever of 105. 105 fever for an adult is deadly. Everyone in the entourage, they're all telling her she should go to the hospital. And Anna says, no, she's not going to the hospital. And here's the thing, they actually listened to her. The fact that, that someone didn't take her to the hospital was really no surprise to me because she was scared the press would find out she was there. And then it would turn into some big headline that she didn't want any of that. Over the next three days, Anna is pretty sick. She's not eating, she's sleeping a lot and the people with her are starting to notice some strange smell coming from her. It showed me that, you know, that uh, the side of her body was uh, infected. It looked infected. It was, it, was, it was different colors and it was swollen. On the third day, Howard finds her in a confused state sitting in the empty bathtub. That night, Dr. Arashevich tells Anna she's got to get back to L.A., but Anna doesn't want her to go. He was begging her to stay. She was saying that she didn't know she could make it. The morning of February 8th, Anna Nicole is very weak. At around noon, Howard K. Stern decides he's going to keep his appointment to see the boat, even though Anna's too sick to go with him. Taz and Brigitte stays with her. After about an hour, Taz goes in where Anna Nicole is. She calls her husband, Big Mo, Anna's bodyguard. Well, Brigitte hears this conversation and she's excited. She thinks her friend is finally awake and they can visit. I walked over and I realized there was something wrong with Anna. She looked like she was sleeping, but I realized that she wasn't breathing. There was no chest movement and then it all exploded. So Bridget tells Taz to call 911. What happens next is unbelievable. Taz doesn't call 911. She calls Mo. Mo doesn't call 911. He calls Howard. And Howard doesn't call 911. 38 minutes go by before anyone calls 911. All the while, Taz is desperately trying to resuscitate Anna. Finally, Mo arrives at the hotel, and once he gets there, he calls 911. Hello, Tamaris. Hi, this is Seminole, please. If you can please respond to the Hard Rock, room 607. It's going to be in reference to a white female. She's not breathing and she's not responsive. She's um, actually Anna Nicole Smith. We arrived on scene and the paramedics went to work on the subject and I tried to find out what exactly happened prior to her being found unconscious. And then Howard shows up and Howard went into just a total frenzy. He was 
pacing. He told me he was calling a doctor in California. Howard is calling Dr. Oroshevich, who confirms that Anna was on 10 different medications, all of which Oroshevich prescribed. And some were not written in Anna's name. Meanwhile, the paramedics are still working on Anna. I just started screaming her name. I asked her, I said, baby girl, if you got anything in you, please come back. Danny Lynn needs you. I said, forget it. I need you. We all need you. And I could feel her energy, like giving me a hug. And then she was gone. And I knew she wouldn't be back. After we had done everything we could there, we transported her to Memorial Regional Hospital. When the ambulance gets to Memorial Regional Hospital, there is a full-on media blitz, cameras rolling everywhere. We are waiting to hear some word during a press conference. We're told that press conference might not happen. It was um, quite a scene. My guys were being filmed as they were taking the subject out of the rescue truck and wheeling her into the emergency room. At 2.49 this afternoon, we were advised by hospital personnel that Anna Nicole Smith had died. Anna Nicole Smith is pronounced dead at 2.49 p.m. It's just confirmed that Anna Nicole Smith has died. She collapsed at a Florida hotel. She was 39 years old. It takes months before the police investigation is finished. The question of why no one called 911 sooner is never fully answered. And when the autopsy is released, it is shocking. February 2007, all kinds of news is being made. Today in Iraq, another chopper down. We're going to go to that rampage in an upscale shopping mall in Salt Lake City, Utah. And even with all that going on, so many people are talking about Anna Nicole Smith. All we really know about Anna Nicole's death at this point is that she died alone. I was covering Anna Nicole Smith for ABC News, and it was a zoo. And she was unconscious, unresponsive, according to... Certainly all the tabloids, the tabloid TV shows, the news magazines were on top of it. The Anna Nicole Smith story continues. Once again, Jim Avila. The place where Anna Nicole Smith's candle would finally burn out. Every channel, no matter what channel I turned, no matter where I went to, it was on the news. I looked at the TV. I think that's when it hit me. The person that was on the TV is the person that was in all the photographs. The autopsy results point to an accidental overdose of prescription drugs. She had nine drugs in her system at therapeutic levels. She also had a stomach bug and an abscess from where she got the shot of B12 and HGH. It also showed a diagnosis of Hashimoto's disease. That's an autoimmune disease that affects the thyroid. The symptoms are weight gain, fatigue, and depression. All of the things that she'd been struggling with all her life had a diagnosis, but she'd never received it in life. Now it is a battle over her body. There's basically a fight about Anna Nicole and where to bury her. Her mother, Virgie, wants her buried in Texas, and Howard K. Stern wants her buried in the Bahamas. As the key players face off in court for the first time. There are a staggering 14 attorneys present. The court proceedings about where she should be buried are televised. There's no circus here, my friend. There's no circus here. Don't, don't get slippery with me. Don't get cute. The court decides that Anna's gonna be buried next to her son in the Bahamas. I want them to be together. <laughs> I have never seen a judge cry on the stand like that. The battle over Anna Nicole Smith's final resting place is finally over, clearing the way for her funeral. It was emotional. I tried to put the paternity stuff aside. Meanwhile, there's still a battle going on over who the father is of Anna Nicole's baby. The estate of Howard Marshall is still pending. If that is successful, this child is going to get tens of millions of dollars. And who that father is, is now of a whole lot greater importance and a lot more potential payoff. 
There are the final four who claim to be Danny Lynn's daddy. There's Howard K. Stern. There's Larry Burkhead. There's the ex-boyfriend, Mark Haddon, who claimed he gave Anna frozen sperm. And lastly, there is Prince Frederick von Anhalt, perhaps most famous for being the fourth husband of Zsa Zsa Gabor. There are lots of people who could be the father. Could you be the father? No, I don't know. I mean, you know, sometimes I'm a bad boy, yeah. But only DNA will tell. There hasn't been a paternity test because Howard and the baby are in the Bahamas. And in the Bahamas, Howard is the father, period. Larry's lawyer does a bunch of legal maneuvers and eventually cracks the Bahamas system. But before Howard is forced to do anything, he relents and gets a sample of the baby's DNA. I'm in this Bahamas courtroom. I'm sitting there, Howard K. Stern's on one side. I'm on the other side. They open the envelope and they said that Larry Burkett is the father. 